Hello, MS Ignite. I'm Rick Hepworth, and welcome to yet another Community Reporter video. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have with me a man who I've known for many years. He used to be an MVP before he started working for Microsoft. Andrew Westgarth, who is now a senior program manager on the App Services team. So, it's great to have you with me. Um, you guys have made some fairly major announcements, haven't you? And I believe you are the man in charge of delivering containers and App Services. Well, I deliver Windows containers. <laughs> so we've had Linux containers roughly in GA when we added container support to that in the building preview and we also bought containers to the website environment. But up till now we've not had Windows containers for the app service. So it's something that customers have been asking us for for a while. We've also solved a number of challenges um, in the customer space. Our primary goal really was we see a lot of customers who have on a .NET Framework app, but they don't really have a route to the cloud variables. So, in app service, all apps are self-contained inside a sandbox. And that sandbox restricts what access you have to underlying APIs and like facilities on inside Windows. And it's a managed service, a platform service, and we manage the underlying infrastructure. In order to provide that complex service, we need to have that security barrier. So, but then we have customers who come along and say, well, I've got a .NET 2, .NET 3, 5, whatever version of .NET application and others, other languages which have dependencies where they actually need access to the host machine. And we don't allow you to do that. Whereas when we bring along bringing custom containers in Windows, the container itself becomes a security sandbox because we use Hyper-V isolation or Hyper-V And then the customer's got their own kernel. They've got their own, particularly their version of Windows Server. Uh, if you're running full.net framework, you need to run the Windows Server uh, Core image. And if you're running .NET Core, then you can use the Server Nano image. Um, but it does give the customer the ability to be able to install into the GAP, which is very common in the GAP. But like they actually think that we're going to um, Install components, so database libraries for other, other databases that we don't support out of Component libraries, all of these sort of things that are very familiar in enterprise. So I was there, I did 1.0, I did ASP, developed whole fusion, so I'm like way back. And I appreciate what customers need to do to deliver to bring these applications. So we're, we're looking to help customers initially do um, lift and shift, because that's the first stage of most customers cloud life, uh, life cycle, let's do a lift and shift. I've got this resource, I need to move it into the cloud, what's the fastest way? And we're trying to look at Instead of lift and shift to IaaS, we used to have the manager of lift and shift by a container put into the cloud service. Then you get deployment slots, easy authentication, MSI, all of the different cool things that we have in the app service. And then we get you in, in the ecosystem, you can um, call CICD pipeline, web box, all of the cool stuff that you get from the platform and service that you don't have to, that you have to build if you're in IaaS. Um, so we've done that initially, that's the first step. Then we're looking at customers who have dependencies. Um, is, that, is that something we can help them do? Um, custom cultures, farms, environments. Um, and we're looking at those kind of scenarios, those five key scenarios. And then obviously, last but not least, is the .NET Core development. We do have customers that have a dependency on Windows capabilities, and they must run in a Windows container, and we've not had that option. Because um, they could. Uh, deploy .NET Core apps to standard apps, service, but then they don't get access to those APIs which they want to. So that's where we're looking. It's, giving, it's about giving customers choice. A lot of folks say, do I need to put it in a container or can I just build it? But it's truly about customer choice and being the first pattern. Any HTTP worker in the IT platform is going to be providing the excellent service. Okay. So you obviously here at Ignite, you're, you're manning the expo. I know you, you did a session on Tuesday, Tuesday yeah. about this. Um, part of the reason we come to Ignite is so that people like me can come and talk to people like you and, and there's that exchange of ideas. Um, have you had some good conversations with people since you made the announcement? Has there, there, there been a positive yeah. approach to this from, from the people you've been talking to in the expo? Yeah, it's been positive from customers in the expo and after the session. But it's also been positive since we did the private preview. So we announced the prior private preview as well. And then we announced the product quick preview on the night of August. And we've only just recently turned on the actual pricing. So it's actually free for about six, seven weeks for customers to just go and use it. 
Well, we've had some interesting discussions both today and previously. We've had customers say immediately, is this available in app service or not? Because the kind of customers that are looking at it are those kind of customers who want the isolation. And no, we're not there yet. The idea is we will GA the general feature and then we will start to look at bringing it into app service requirements. But customers are lighting up at the option to be able to get access to that. Because that's often something that they stop. Something as simple as being able to generate a PDF from a HTTP URL, you know, it's very easy to replicate the issue, and I, I did it myself. I just did a quick search on the internet, and I said, well, give me a .NET Framework component that does PDF generation. Run up a simple hello world, you know, great web app, installed that with one line of code, one text box, bang, straight away on standard app service, I get a yellow screen in that. If I go into our sandbox, device, I can see it's called Edge of Library. As soon as I just add the Docker file to that app, put it in a container and deploy via Windows containers, wow, all of a sudden it just works. And so it was a very simple migration story there as well. So we're seeing some interesting conversations with customers who are like, oh, this likes up and different scenarios for us. It gives them alternatives to other routes that they're looking at. So we're really excited to see what customers do. And I certainly am, so I'm to get the feedback. Um, you know, we're not, it's, it's in public previous day. We've got some challenges to solve, and that's what we're working hard for doing now. Um, a cold start coming on that is set for an image. It's a large image. Um, so we're looking at what we can do to mitigate those issues um, so that the customer doesn't feel it so much. Certainly once the applications are coming in the container, the big thing with containers is the extraction time. That's very CPU intensive. So once the container's down and we've extracted it, then we can get your setup to running quite quickly. This is why we talk about using uh, cached images, so we cached and base images, Windows Server 4, LTSC, same for Nano. And then if customers build their containers based off that, the only thing that we're really down burning at that time is the, their particular layer that's going to be down the base image. And then it's the extraction time, which takes time. Once you've got the run in, it's just like a little sample. You get your auto scale, you get to scale out, scale up, the same thing. So, I have to admit, and I know you're late for this, I haven't played with this yet. So, one of the great things about an app service is I can just take my website, I can drop it into an Azure website. And I get all that rich telemetry, logging, and everything else that you guys admit, pretty much for free. If I'm running inside my own container, do I still get all of that support and telemetry? So we're working on, one of the benefits that we have uh, with Windows containers is because they're the same OS as the original offering. So on, on the Linux side of the house, we have to do a little bit more work for lighting these features, but on the Windows side, ostensibly, it's quite easy for us to light them up. And customers will always, already see if they go into a port, they can compare side by side a Windows code based deployment or a Windows container based deployment. And they'll see there's very little difference in terms of features that are lit up. So if they grade out the things that we've got, um, so we have got applications, but our guidance there is to use App Insights and actually have it be ejected outside of the container into App Insights so you get a much better experience. Um, customers can still use libraries that they still traditionally use, like from there, all of these different things. Um, but with the container, the one thing to remember is the container doesn't have persistent storage. So once the container shuts down for whatever reason, it starts back up again and we're talking back to a clean version of your site. You can still mount the same storage that we have traditionally in app services, just an app set in the same as we have with Linux custom containers, and then you can write to that file system. But one of the other things that we announced this week on the Linux side of the house is the ability to bring your own storage. We've been asked, we've been asked for a long time by customers. I want to mount the storage for Azure files for Azure Docs. Why can't you just make that happen? All oh, right, so, so you support the Docker storage drivers? So we've got an ability with inside app service to mount. Um, on Linux, they can mount volumes from files that they can mount from the cloud We mount them as additional map files. Um, in the Windows container, we've already got support for the Azure files, so I demoed that on Tuesday. Um, and all we're waiting for is the PowerShell and the CLI support so that we can actually go out and publicize that information is available. So I demoed that and I was trying that with and we just end up we, we what, what we basically do is we map a folder inside the container and then here ostensibly it's just multiple 
Mars is actually not the Titan Mars. So that opens up a lot of new avenues, especially for persistence stuff, which is actually quite simple at the moment. So that's, that's cool, and that's, that's interesting, and we hope to be able to have an issue blog post soon about all the different things that we've lit up recently. We've added more regions before we came through the night, so we know in Australia, um, North Europe, East US, and Southeast Asia as well, which are new regions that we didn't have um, previously. And as we get towards GA, we will have it in all of our regions so we can get access to the, the resources. So that's going to be cool to see as well. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll have a blog post coming soon. Maybe it's not this week, because um, I want to make sure that all the tutorials there, we're doing an everything we do. And this is the stuff we talked about at Ignite, and this is what we're going to do. So um, deployment slots, slot swap, kind of shares, and some of the recipes that I've got. For example, Dr. Carl, how to say, run an MSI, run an XC as part of my build in my container. So that when they build the container and then publish the actual image itself to ACR on top of ACR's actual container registry, then the customers have examples to go for. And as we go forward, we build the best. We're working with the uh, studio team, the Azure DevOps team, and the ACR team to actually build with them the server the best practices, experience that we have with customers running our, ourselves. And it's every day to school day. Right? And that's why we all are in the world. It's like, I, every day I go, I go to work and I'm finding something new. It's business processes, technical response, how do I do this and how do I solve it better? So that's something else that I really want to do. So how to build your container so that you're doing the right thing. So you're not shipping things in your container that you really don't want, but you don't need it. You, you make modifications to the base and you remove that intermediary part and then you just take over your application. Everything's installed and you don't have to pay and this is sitting around using this space or making your image even bigger when you don't actually need it at runtime. So things like that. Tuesday. So when I look at containers and Azure, there's a fairly rich menu, shall yes. we say, yeah. of, of, of stories that I can look at in container deployment. Um, where does app services sit in, in that, that, that menu? What, what kind of applications, if you, if you like, that I'm writing are the best fit for the services that you're writing? So the way I look at it, because I did a free day on Sunday and we got this exact same question. We, we got this question built. We're actually on the banner of containers. It's what is the water slightly, and it's a fair comment because we get it from the customers all the time. The way I look at app service, in fact, the way that app service is marketed, containers, if you've got a HTTP, HTTPS workload, so you're running across HTTP protocol, app service is premium choice first. And we, we would like to be able to work with and operate everything that you need on that platform that's the de facto platform on And then once you look into having um, multi architecture or you need, say, different environments, TCP or anything like this sort of stuff. And um, then we start looking at what else have we got. So at the very base level, we've got Azure Container instances, which will let you do anything you want. But then it's effectively an, an IaaS solution. If you think about it, it's containers. There's no, there is a management layer on the whole thing, but it's still running in bare metal, kind of running Hyper-V with your container. Right. Then the service fabric, which do another type of orchestration. And then the, the next part is to look at Kubernetes, which gives you even more to get uh, the orchestration. The containers give you the, the ability to be able to move into any environment in one place. Right now, for Windows containers, there's, there's hosting with us, ACI, and I believe service coverage, uh, Kubernetes KS. down to the level of control you can uh, in, in block distance. Like, we want to use a free map platform. We want to add value to our application. We want to use all the services in our service. And that's what we come in. Literally, the first choice is, well, I might want to take HTTP, HTTP. I am, and that's my issue. Absolutely. If you're not doing that, then we're straight away at the equation. OK. So, so let's pivot then as we, we hit sort of halfway. Not only are you, you the, the, the guy for containers and app services, you're also the guy for app services on Azure Stack. Yes, I own our own offering as well. 
I think. So when when you were asked to, to bring what is one of the most popular resource providers in the public cloud into the, the, the cloud consistent world of the stack, how did you tackle it? Did, did you did you start from scratch? Did you did you sort of branch the code and, and start off from there? How how do you do that to bring you know something that's used to running on thousands and thousands and thousands of instances worldwide to something that's running on you know four servers in my data center? So we've had a history um, in the app service team of on premise deployments. A lot of the team came from basically the layer by a long history with it. Um, and the app service on Azure Stack product, um, the code is exactly the same as what we run in Azure. There's no fault. We have different branches, but it's exactly the same. So when we do a release in, in Azure, like we've just completed, then we maybe three months later, once those features are bedded in and we know that we're back to test, then we integrate down into our branches for the app service on Azure Stack product. And that's what forms the basis of our we do from the resource part. But long before that, we had Windows Azure Pack websites, which we were on the Azure Pack part. So we've had, uh, what, three to five years of running that in business data centers, and maybe you know, posting very successful businesses, but not, not a large person is still using it today. And so we were able to, to take the benefits of that, that was running on arbitrary any VM. Standard up in Hyper-V, standard up in VM, whichever you want to do. Um, and there it was, we basically shipped the software and the customer provided the infrastructure. So we had a, a model. And then early days with the, uh, the Azure Stack team, they were wanting some PLC, and we, we did some work to get it up and running and things like that. And the deployment model is slightly different on, um, on Azure Stack because we don't have that whole set of pictures. But the deployment model for you installing your stack or the deployment model for me deploying my website? Us is ostensibly deploying the resource provider and how we provision resources on the back end. So in, in the public cloud, we, we use cloud services. But on the private cloud, in the private cloud, in Azure Stack, we don't have cloud services. So we drop them to be at scale services and availability services. So the most of the architecture that we have to do actually is to provision the resources as part of the instant. Normally it's a case of you get a machine, you install our software on it, and that becomes a controller. You configure the controller and then that rolls out all of the information to the as we use one. Um, so this time what we had to do is actually to build a large template which provisions all of the resources, large arm template, standard stuff that everybody else uses to build their resources. Um, available sets of our controllers because we need public IPs on both instances. Then we use scale sets behind load balancers for various other pieces, and then we have other different tools. It's all configured by installer. We already had the installer for our apps in the cloud. We brought that forward, and what that does is it takes information from you that you've been through before. We authenticate so we can talk to ARM. We make sure that we've got identity out of details from AED or AFS. We make sure that we've got all the custom configuration things, names, passwords, certificates, um, configuration, how you have an initial farm to it. And then we generate a template and then we initiate the arm deployment. We just talk to Azure Stack and we say, okay, we want X, Y, and Z, please deliver. Once it's delivered, we go ahead and do an install. We get to a point where we're confident the install is completed. We register the resource provider against Azure Stack in arm, and then we add the gap. And then once that's deployed, done. And so we do go from, yes, admittedly, in, in Azure, we're running on height and scale, but we've got the benefits of that to be able to come down to Azure Stack, which could be in a smaller scale, but it can go as big as Azure Stack is. So you, know, you mentioned the 4 node, but Azure Stack could go 12 node, 16 node. 16 node, yeah, they were working on those. So they didn't know where they were working on those. So now we can go up in a 16 node pack, and then we can use as big as the customer wants to get to. Um, so we've seen some a variety of different size and um, but we are also looking at how do we take that working with the Azure Stack to an even bigger scale so that they can start some kind of regions so it's such a are familiar with in, in Azure today have the same thing. Um, and the Azure Stack story has got has the potential to be really interesting because um, a 
you can tell why that is. Uh, we've been friends for a long time. I'm also a Brit. And we know all about data governance and sovereignty and oh, yes. all the challenges that offers. And I've just talked to customers around the globe for a long time. Um, and often they'll say, when are you building an Azure data center in my country? Because my data cannot go anywhere. And there are legitimate reasons for all that. And having an Azure stack, whether it's in their enterprise, or whether it's your service provider in that country, opens up Azure services for them, but also keeps them the data sovereignty. So that's, it's, it's, it has the potential to be really, really powerful because we've got so many data centers, but then our partners have data centers, our service providers have data centers. So you can see Azure being a global to the point where customers are great to look for browsing and find out the services. And as you say, I've said this in one of my conferences on the Azure platform, so it's great to be able to be able to Azure Stack customers and see how we can help them along with their app optimization strategy and the story, but also to help them as a, as a next step to get to Azure. But our API versions are pretty much in sync with Azure. It's one of the challenges we have on Azure Stack, and some things on the API versions are slightly behind, but certainly for app services, um, the, end of the next update, you will be literally in stock sync. With the latest API versions that are currently in place, and that's just going to be challenging. We try really hard, whatever we deliver in that service on Azure Stack, we try every validation to make sure that things are being So, not just consistent, but the way that we work on the whole of society. I presume that there are some constraints. So, for example, there is no nested virtualization yet. Stack so yep. Windows containers uh, isn't going to happen until then. So, um, the, oh, the mule bar. Do you do you try and take the approach that that you will keep everything in step with the public cloud and simply filter out the things that can't be delivered in the stack because of the underlying infrastructure? Need? And then when they light up that thing that enables you, you will simply light up that feature. By and large, yes. So. Um, yeah, in case in point Windows containers, we need the DB3 sleep for that's not So we put the request in, you know, a long list of requests, like any other team. Um, and we work closely with them. But then there's, there's things like um, hybrid connections. It needs service to relay on the hook to work, and we don't have so many business stacks. So when that team drops that, then maybe in the next few hours, we validate the feature. VNet integration, again, we're missing some pieces of networking. In fact, the stuff that Christina was talking about on Tuesday, so um, if anybody interested in app service networking, please check out Christina Conkey's session on Tuesday. Yes, because there's some really great stuff in that that will be extremely useful some for my customers. So yeah, are you hoping that that can ripple down? Well, when we spoke to Azure Stack Networking originally, we tasked them with doing it the way that we currently do things. Oh, with the but then the earlier this year, we, always, we sat down and said, well, hang on, this is changing. So we went straight to them and said, look, that's not as important as you want to unify the code base and make sure that you're not deviating. And then we want these new features. So if it's going to be a significant amount of resource, then let's target the things that are more useful. But not just us, but anybody. So we do that. And then diagnostics of the service is one thing that we don't have to do on the stack. And the whole Azure app service diagnostics feature, which Jen's talking about tomorrow. Around about lunchtime, um, and we really want to do that because that will help our customers' customers to be able to diagnose issues before they, they have to deal with the code and do support. And then, and then with Windows containers, we've talked about Linux containers, we are looking at what we can do to bring those features down. We, we could do it. The challenge also on Azure Stack is giving the cloud admin the tooling to actually support the platform. That's one of the challenges. And that can sometimes prevent us from necessarily lighting the key. So Linux support for a lot of admins who are used to a Windows world, it's very difficult. So we need to make sure that the tool in the processes and the capabilities that we have in Azure are also able for us to bring them down. In a, it'll be a small form to start with because we don't, we're not necessarily going to always have the same infrastructure. But yeah, that's, that's, that tends to be our process. We're not in terms of feature parity for the standard Windows app service, we are very proud of us. I think the latest things that we were looking at but haven't completed yet are remote debugging within Visual Studio. We need to make that work in ADFS as well because of um, Azure Stack can be deployed in ADFS and AD. 
and uh, MySQL. And then there are the two main like, headlight features that we would bring for tenants. Um, and we tend to arguably focus on the Azure Stack side more than admin. So the tenant features can kind of take care of themselves. We make sure that there we integrate with Validate. And it's the admin story. How do we enable and unify the code base and make sure that we're not deviating? And then we want these new features. So if it's going to be a significant amount of resource, then let's target all the things that are more useful. For not just us, but anybody. So we do that. And then diagnostics is the service is one thing that we don't have to do on the Azure Stack. And that whole Azure App Service Diagnostics feature, which Jen's talking about tomorrow, I think around about lunchtime. Um, and we really want to do because that will help our customers, customers to be able to diagnose issues before they, they have to pick up the phone and do something. And then, and then with Windows containers, we've talked about Linux containers. We are looking at what we can do to bring those features down. We, we could do it. The challenge also on Azure Stack is giving the cloud admin the tooling to actually support the platform. That's one of the challenges. And that can sometimes prevent us from necessarily lighting the key. So Linux support for a lot of admins who are used to a Windows world, it's very difficult. So we need to make sure that the tooling, the processes, and the capabilities that we have in Azure are also able to bring in a albeit small form to start with, because we don't we're not necessarily going to always have the same infrastructure. But yeah, that's, that's that tends to be our process. We're not in terms of feature parity for the standard Windows app service, we are very proud to us. I think the latest things that we were looking at completed yet. Uh, remote debugging within Visual Studio. We need to make that work in ADFS as well because of um, Azure Stack can be deployed in ADFS or ADD and uh, MySQL. And then there are the two main like, headlight features that we bring for tenants. Um, and we tend to arguably focus on the Azure Stack side more than admin. So the tenant features can kind of take care of themselves. We make sure that there we integrate with Validate and it's the admin story. How do we enable cloud admins on the ground to do the same job that we do day to day within the offices of the admin? Okay, so um, we don't have long left because I can see the producer over there is going to start throwing things at me shortly. Um, I was actually talking to um, Christos Matkas earlier, um, and he used to work for Microsoft in the UK, has now got a cross to call. You took an even bigger job because you used to work outside Microsoft. You were an MVP. You were, you were um, an IIS MVP, and, 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 and a great sort of pillar of the UK MVP community. Um, how have you found that transition from, from outside Microsoft to inside Microsoft and from, from outside the US into the US? Has, has, has it been an exciting change? Has it been interesting? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been really interesting. It's, it's don't get me wrong, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of change. And you're right, I've moved one and a half thousand miles away from family and friends. Um, and I don't get to see those family and friends all that often. Um, but the, the opportunity to work on apps is that I've been really here. So I've always had a passion. Uh, I started off with the web back in the early 90s when we were all using 28k modems or even slower than that. It was the power to be able to put, build something in a few minutes and publish it. And literally everybody on the planet can take advantage of it and use it. Um, so that's what got me into web technology. And then when I started looking at cloud, looking at global scale, reaching billions of people, App Service handles over 24 billion requests every day, 18,000 VMs. We're like the fourth or fifth service that goes into any Azure data center. So working on that scale, there's very few places that I can get that opportunity. So I'm thankful I've got a very very good support network behind me. My wife's also so my kids, um, but and, and they it had to be a family decision. So we made a family decision to give it a go. And we came out here two and a half, two, two and three quarters uh, years ago. And we're still going. We enjoy it out here. It works phenomenal. The team's great to work with. Um, you know, I struggled to go and get you know mince pie and chips and stuff like that. But, uh, I'm from the northeast, so there's certain you know I do like my pies. And, do like a good Sunday guys, we can do that. Um, and there's challenges in getting the home comfort and kind of adjusted to other things. And where we're not, there's always uh, plenty of online shops to be able to go and get things from. 
So yeah, I've got my Yorkshire tea and sort of drink that daily in the office. Um, and I've had comments about the fact that I bring sandwiches into work and eat my dinner at work and stuff. But you know, uh, I could go into the canteen, but then I'm going to spend about 50 dollars a week just on my lunch. So you can take me out and I can take me out and stay with me. So um, football's hard. So. They don't weird, really know what football is in this country. Yeah, it's this the wrong bullshit. Egg shaped thing that you play with pads and you hit each other pretty hard. But I like, you know, I, I, I grew up in the 80s where you do hit each other pretty hard in attack it. As long as it's clean, then everybody's happy. Um, but yeah, I'm a massive Simmons fan. I miss, miss that. But now with the streaming capabilities that we've got in the world now, I can see I just have a slight like, argument like three or a half o'clock and I'm going to watch at seven o'clock on Saturday. So. <laughs> You've not got him into the red jersey yet. Um, he's just started uh, football training on Sunday morning, so that's awesome. He just likes it. He has got his strips, he just likes to go to the He's He's got the parts. So, yeah, we, we're having fun out here. It's a big jump. Um, working inside the club is different. Um, so, I was a retired employee and uh, I had to just do things and visit occasionally. But now, I'm actually working with people that used to be product team when I was in my piece. So that was a little transitional change. They're my colleagues now, not just the people that I would send emails to. So that was strange. It's a phenomenal team to work with. I've had a lot of fun in the day and um, I just enjoy adding value to both customers and also to my colleagues. It's a really tight new team. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I have now been glad <laughs> so we are going to have to wrap. Um, Andy, it's it's been a real pleasure. It's it's great to be able to, to talk to you, and um, the the stuff that you're doing, the, the some of the Azure Stack stuff, I find really you know great personal benefits and the, the stuff that me and my customers are using. So keep up the good work, and you know one of these days we're going to black and white juice, right? No, never. <laughs> Never, ever, ever. Well, thank you very much, and thank you as well.